Okay, well, um, for me here in Perth, it's good morning, everyone. Good afternoon to you if it's um, afternoon in your time zone. Today, we have an extra special meeting of the Australian Sensitive Data Interest Group. We're here in collaboration um, with the Machine Learning for Australia um, community of practice as well, um, teamed up with some colleagues at the ARDC who run the other community of practice group, because we thought this topic would be of interest to both communities um, about leveraging sensitive data with federated machine learning. Um, so um, before we begin, I'd just like to start with an acknowledgement of country. So I acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet. Um, for me, that's the lands of the Wajak Mungar people here in Perth. Um, and on a personal note, um, I have been um, told quite authoritatively by an Aboriginal elder that my name, Kylie, is actually an Aboriginal word for boomerang. And I do seem to find my way back to places I've been before. I actually studied here at Curtin University. I'm back working here now. So um, nice to have a little link there. I'd also like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Okay, so I have pressed the record button for this session. Um, that's so that it can be published on the AusDig YouTube channel so people can do it at a later date. So just bear in mind um, if you are choosing to share your video um, or you're asking any questions that that will appear on the, on the recording, so just bear that in mind. Okay, so I'll just hand over actually to my colleague Mohammed to say a little bit about know. the machine I learning AU. Well, 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 maybe on the Oh, thank you, thank you, Kylie. Um, so uh, I'm Mohammed, I'm also from ARDC. So myself and Nana are just like um, coordinating this machine learning community of practice. So this is a one-page overview of. Um, what this community of practice is currently doing. Um, so this machine learning community of practice actually provides an opportunity for anyone who are interested in machine learning research. So one of our objective is to provide collaboration um, between researchers um, and, and also for the industry leads who are working in, in this area. Um, and what this community is practice facilitating is it, it facilitates knowledge exchange and sharing um, and the best practices around machine learning um, and other areas such as deep learning, reinforcement learning, and the other components of um, uh, machine learning. And, and in terms of knowledge sharing, um, today is one of the examples where um, uh, um. Anis is like sharing his experience around uh, federated learning and um, sensitive data. So this community of practice is called by staff from ARDC um, and from other increase and computing facilities such as CSIRO and CI and POSI. Um, and there are other community of practices or there are other organizations who are contributing to this um, in this community of practice. Um, so um, we, we welcome um, you all um, if you are interested in machine learning uh, research and if you are interested in hearing about uh, existing challenges, um, the barriers and the potential solutions, we welcome you all to join this community of practice. Um, and for doing so, um, there is a QR code which is listed in this website. Um, you can join this community of practice using this QR code or the ML4AU website, which is also listed here. Um, so the slides will be made available after this session. Um, so you can just easily scan this QR code and um, attend this uh, community of practice. Um, so there are a couple of more slides um, that I will be handing over again to my ADC colleague, um, Kylie. Um, so it's Kylie, it's up to you now. Thanks so much, Mohammed. That's a great intro. So um, for any people who found their way to this seminar um, through the machine, <coughs> excuse me, machine learning community of practice. OSDIC is the Australian Sensitive Data Interest Group, so open to anybody with an interest in sensitive data. We have people from all sorts of areas, um, lots of health and medical, some agricultural people, lots of people from universities, research interests, um, ecological data, 
all sorts of things. So you are very welcome to join. Um, the mailing list doesn't spam you and it's not something where you're going to get, you know, hundreds of emails each week. Um, it's mostly used for um, advising people about our next webinars coming up and some questions that people want feedback from the um, sensitive data community. Um, we have nearly 300 people on that list now, so it's a great brains trust to traffic tap into if you've got any questions. We also have a collaborative notes document set up for this session um, and there's space on there for suggestions for future meetings if you have any great ideas. We have a fantastic team of co-chairs um, that we work with to do lots of planning but um, always great to get ideas from people out there. So I'll post the link to that in the chat in a minute. So over to our speaker today, Amir Anis, who's from the Australian Cancer Data Network. Um, so the ACDN is a federated network focused on providing additional evidence for case of cancer patients, clinicians and healthcare systems. The network has nodes across Australia with links internationally and is primarily focused on radiology, oncology currently. So I will now hand over to Amir um, to maybe just introduce yourself um, and to tell us all about leveraging sensitive data with federated machine learning. And I think we'll have time for questions at the end. So yeah, over to you, Amir. Thanks, Kylie. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon or good morning. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks, Kylie, for giving this opportunity to present our work on federated learning. Um, in this seminar. Um, I am Amir Anis. I am a postdoc researcher at Ingham, working under the supervision of Professor Louis Holloway. And my role is to develop algorithms for federated uh, learning, and then to deploy those federated learning uh, algorithms um, to our distributed hospitals, uh, including registries as well. So I'll quickly share my screen. Is this visible? Yes, it is. Um, you're just <laughs> in working mode at the moment, not in slideshow. I guess you can't see that. Uh, if you could just, yep, perfect. Yeah, cool. cool. Okay, so yeah, today's talk um, is, is regarding the introduction to uh, this federated machine learning and how can we use this uh, uh, to use uh, uh, sensitive data or to preserve the uh, privacy of the sensitive data. Uh, these are the these are the contents uh, for today's uh, talk. I'll begin with the problem, the why uh, of of this federated learning. Why do we need federated learning at first place? Um, followed by um, a bit of introduction to federated learning, how, frame, how this framework uh, works, uh, what are the different components involved um, in this um, uh, federated learning uh, process, um, followed by a small, uh, small practical demonstration in a Python um, programming environment. It's not a not, not a hands-on uh, practice. It's just a you know uh, go over through uh, a piece of code uh, that we have modified from a Flower uh, FL uh, framework. Uh, so I'll go over through uh, that code uh, very briefly, but if someone is interested in knowing more about that, I would be more than happy to uh, talk about the uh, details of that. Then um, I'll talk about the different types of uh, federated learning. And uh, I'll, I'll also talk about some of the work that we have developed uh, at Ingham in regard to different types of FL. And finally, I'll conclude uh, with some of the uh, remarks and some of the future uh, works as well. Um, for those who don't know about uh, machine learning, uh, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to what is machine learning. Um, so traditionally, in a traditional programming um, setting, uh, we have inputs and a bunch of rules, and we fed these inputs and bunch of rules to the machine. And based on these inputs and rules that we have written in a, in a programming uh, environment, 
uh, the machine will give us the appropriate or respective outputs. However, in a machine learning setting, we give the pair the pairs of inputs and outputs to the machine. And based on these pairs, the machine try to learn uh, the meaningful or the complex patterns between the inputs and outputs. And based on these patterns, uh, we expect some kind of rules uh, or machine learning model um, as, as, as you say. So this is a training phase uh, where machine learns the meaningful patterns uh, regarding the pairs of inputs and outputs and gives us the rules. And in the second phase, which is the testing phase of the machine learning, uh, we apply this learned uh, machine learning model, these rules to a new set of data, a new set of inputs, uh, and the machine will give us uh, the outputs or it will predict the likelihood uh, of a particular outcome. Now, machine learning has seen uh, tremendous success in vast variety of applications. Uh, from engineering to health, uh, to finance, uh, to computer science, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the, the reason of this success is mainly due to the quality uh, and more importantly, the quantity of the data being gathered. Generally, the more the data we have, uh, the better the machine learning model is. However, in, in some applications, uh, the data is generated uh, at the end nodes, for example, the mobile phones uh, or the hospitals. Ideally, what we would, would want is to gather uh, this data, which is generated on these end nodes uh, to a centralized server so that we can apply this machine learning uh, to this collected centralized data uh, and we can train our machine learning model on it. However, due to the nature of the sensitive data that has been generated here, for example, the patient's data generated at the hospitals, uh, due to the privacy issues, it is not feasible uh, to send or collect the data from these distributed clients uh, to a centralized server. What it implies that um, because we don't have uh, the centralized data, because we don't have all the data, which is generated on these distributed uh, clients, it means that we cannot do the traditional centralized machine learning uh, and we cannot solve some of the critical problems uh, in these sort of applications. Now, to, to tackle this problem, to tackle this privacy issue uh, in, this, in this kind of setting where we have distributed clients and a server, we can use a framework known as federated learning. In federated learning, instead of collecting data or sending data from these distributed clients to a centralized server, the server actually initializes a random global model and it will send this global model to these distributed clients. Now, by global model, uh, it simply means the model parameters. For example, if we are using a neural network as an underlying machine learning model, uh, then by global model, it means the weight matrices and bias vectors uh, of each of the layer of the neural network. So by global model, it essentially means those different weight matrices and bias vectors. So server will initialize a random global model or model parameters, and it will send this initially uh, initialized uh, random global model to each of, of, of the distributed clients. Upon receiving, each of the client will train this global model on its own local data. So each of the client will have their own local data and they will train the received global model from the server on their local data. And that will yield a, a, a local model from each of the client. And then each client will send this local model uh, to the server. The server, upon receiving these local models, will simply aggregate or averages these local models, which will yield an updated version of the global model. This is one round of the training between server and the client. And after one round, we expect that uh, the global model should be better in terms of the performance uh, as compared to the previous round. So in the next round, the server will send this updated version of the global model to each of the distributed client. Again, the client will again train that global model on their local data and will send the updated version of the local models back to the server and so on and so forth. And this process will, will 
carry on for uh, multiple rounds, maybe 40 or 50, depending upon the type of the data that these local models have. And we expect that the performance in terms of the accuracy uh, will, will increase as we move, uh, in, as, as the number of round uh, increases. <clears throat> so this predicted lettering in this whole uh, setup, the clients never uh, send their raw data, their local model, uh, their, their, uh, their local data to the server. So the privacy of, of the local data is intact. The local the, the clients only share uh, the, the different versions of the local models to the server, and the server will send the version of the global model to each of the uh, distributed clients. So here we can protect the uh, privacy of the local data. Um, we have uh, in-house uh, in-built uh, federated uh, learning network as Kali uh, introduced uh, a CDN is it, it's it's a federated uh, uh, a network which is focused on providing additional evidence for uh, cancer patients. Um, this OSCAT, which is a federated uh, communication network, it has multiple distributed clients across uh, Australia and it has some of uh, international uh, uh, links as well. Let's let's talk about uh, more on the architecture of of the distributed client in this federated uh, learning um, setting. So each of the client will have its own local data, and we we we, we need to preserve the privacy uh, of that uh, local data being held uh, by the client. Then each client uh, will have a machine learning model. Uh, and by machine learning model, I mean it can be a neural network, a logistic regression, a sport vector machine, uh, and so on and so forth. And this machine learning model should be same across all the distributed clients. And not only the machine learning model, but the architecture of that, the, the, the architecture of the machine learning model should be same as well. For example, if the used machine learning model is neural network, uh, then the number of hidden layers in that neural network, the number of neurons per hidden layer should be same across all the clients as well. Then each client will have uh, a training module uh, to train uh, to, to train the machine learning model on their uh, local data. And then we have a testing module as well to evaluate the performance of the model on their uh, testing data set. And then we have this communication module uh, for each of the client in which they, they communicate with the server uh, to exchange those model parameters, local models and the global model. And some of the hyperparameters, uh, for example, learning rate, number of epochs, the number of you know, training phases, and so on and so forth. Uh, these can be similar across uh, those uh, distributed clients, or it can be, uh, or they, they can be different um, as well. For the server, uh, as similar to clients, the server will have a communication mo uh, module in which uh, it will communicate with the clients, with all of the clients to exchange uh, the model parameters. Um, the server has to choose an aggregation strategy. As, as, as I mentioned, the server has to aggregate the local models uh, or average those local models to give, to yield uh, an updated version of the global model. So for the aggregation strategy, we can use either a simple averaging uh, or a weighted averaging. In weighted averaging, we need to take in account the number of data points uh, those local uh, clients have. And based on that, we can use this weighted average uh, aggregation strategy. Beside this, there are other uh, tons of different aggregation strategies available, uh, which can be applied uh, based on the need of the application. And then the server is responsible for say, setting some of the hyperparameters, such as number of participating clients, uh, number of uh, training rounds, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, now a small practical demonstration uh, for this uh, federated learning framework. And for the practical demonstration, we have used uh, a Flower uh, open source FL um, uh, framework. And in this framework, there will be a one centralized uh, server, which is responsible for aggregating the, uh, the local models, uh, responsible for, uh, for the communication uh, with, with the distributed clients. And then we have three distributed clients, uh, each with their own uh, data set. The original code uh, is available at this link. We have modified this link uh, to be more flexible. Uh, pre uh, originally, it was intended for the imaging data. Uh, the number of clients were fixed, and then 
there are a number of other parameters which are not flexible in the original code. We have modified that uh, to be more flexible and you can use your own custom data set um, as well. So let's quickly um, go over through the data first. So we have uh, these three CSV files, three data files, uh, one each for the um, client. So this is data underscore one dot CSV, this is data underscore two, and this is data under uh, three. Each of this, each of these CSV files um, have a local data for each of their client. And the columns of these CSV files represents the input features, um, which are labeled as feature A, feature B, feature C, and feature D. Uh, and then we have the labels, the output item or output feature, which is a binary one. It can have a value of zero or one. And the rows of these, the, the, this, this, this CSV file uh, represents the individual uh, data points. One thing that, that we need to make sure that uh, the data setup is similar across all the distributed clients. It means that all of these three di different clients uh, should have these four features uh, and in the right order as well. So if the client one has ordered the features as feature A, B, C, D, it should be in the right order as far as the other two clients are concerned. And the number of features should be same as well. As far as number of data points are concerned, they can be different uh, from one client to the other. For example, this second client um, has a 450 uh, data points in it. And this third client has um, 475 data points. So the data points can, can be different uh, among, the, among the distributed clients, uh, but the features and the output item or labels should be similar and should be in the right or in the right sequence. Now, if we go uh, through the code, uh, we have these four files, one file for the server and three for the clients. Uh, in a realistic world, ideally, uh, these files will be on the physically distributed uh, clients. So there, there will be one node which, which would run this server uh, Python file, and then we have three physically distributed clients. Each will run their own um, uh, client, client files. But here, just for the demonstration, just for the simulation purposes, we are going to run these four files uh, on a single machine. So in a client file, uh, I'll quickly go, go, we'll go over through uh, the pieces of codes, uh, but if somebody is interested um, uh, in knowing more uh, about these, I would be more than happy to walk about that. So we have a bunch of import files for the libraries and packages. Then we have this load data, uh, a method in which we are loading uh, the local data. For the client one, we have this data underscore one dot CSV file, and we are preparing this data, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 distinguishing uh, the data or um, uh, dividing the data into the training and into the testing uh, data sets. And similarly, the X train and the Y train for the input and the output feature. Then we are defining a neural network, um, a class uh, which is inherited from the PyTorch module uh, here. Uh, we are using a neural network with two hidden layers. Uh, you know, the linear part uh, of the neural network of, of, the, of the first hidden layer followed by the ReLU activation function. Then the second uh, hidden layer followed by, again, the ReLU activation function uh, and so on and so forth. You can modify this um, uh, uh, architecture as, as you want. Um, also, as we are using a tabular data here in which we have four features and one um, label uh, feature, uh, we are using this fully connected neural network. But if we are dealing, let's say, with the imaging data, uh, we may want to modify this uh, architecture in which we have some you know, convolution uh, layers, those polling layers, and, and so on and so forth. Then we have this training uh, method in which we are training our model on the training data set for 10 epochs. And then we have this testing method in which we are evaluating the performance uh, of the machine learning model. So these things, this testing, uh, training, and uh, the definition of the 
um, a machine learning model, this loading data is pretty much the same as we usually do in a centralized machine learning stuff. So there is nothing different uh, in these four methods uh, as compared to what we have in a traditional centralized machine learning way. Then we have this, this class of flower. Uh, Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, so we have this uh, uh, flower client, uh, which is, is a kind of a meat of this, this whole um, uh, simulation in which this, the, this plant, uh, the, this class uh, represent the communication uh, between this flower client and the server. This client has the methods of get parameters, which will, uh, which will receive the model parameters from the server. Uh, set parameters which will send the local model parameters to the server. Uh, this fit method to to train uh, the local model, evaluate to test that uh, local model. Uh, so this class actually represents the, that communication part, the communication module uh, of the client. And then we just need to start this client by using the start underscore client. And in that we need to specify uh, the address of the server, uh, the IP address and the specific port. Uh, as I mentioned, this example is being done uh, on a same machine. That's why I have put this 127.0.0.1, the local host address. But if uh, this client file uh, is, is being run on a physically distributed machine, that then we have to specify the exact uh, address with the port number uh, for the server. So this is the client file for the first client. Uh, the Python files for the for the other two clients will 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 remain same. The only difference uh, is their is their uh, data files. The client two will have this data underscore two dot csv file, uh, and the client three will have a different um, file as well. Now for the server, uh, as I mentioned, the server uh, has to um, uh, has to select an appropriate uh, aggregation method. Uh, here we are using an uh, a weighted average, which is defined in this method. Uh, and then some of the hyperparameters, such as the number of clients, which is set to three, we can change this to four or five, whatever, uh, or how many number of clients uh, there are. Uh, then the number of rounds, in this case, we have set to uh, 100, and that's pretty much it. These some of the hyperparameters and the aggregation strategy. And here we are starting the server by specifying the server address. Again, in this case, it's a local uh, host and we need to specify the right port number. So this is a very uh, you know, a brief um, uh, introduction to, to these uh, Python uh, files. And let's try to run that, run these four files um, on, 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 a, on a same machine. So we have four uh, windows. Um, the first one is for the server and the rest of three are for the uh, clients. To, so to run a server uh, file uh, in Python, I'm just going to type Python 3 and the name of the file, which is server.py. Um, once the server is up and running, we can run Python uh, files for the client. So client one, then Line two, and then we have the client tree. It will take a bit of time um, to do have a connection. Uh, it, it is uh, it is uh, faster here as compared to if we have this in a real world. Uh, obviously, we we have to tackle those communication you know issues and stuff like that, but still it will take uh, a bit of time to connect. Uh, and once uh, uh, the connection has been made, uh, the, the, the training will, will start by the server uh, for 100 uh, rounds. Yep. So it's requesting the initial parameters from one of, of the random clients out of those three clients. So the training has begun, and you can see that it's it's quite fast. Uh, each each round uh, is taking a fairly less amount of uh, time. Uh, the reason is that 
the architecture of that neural network is quite is quite simple, quite less complicated. It has only two hidden layers. But if we had a more complex architecture, let's say for a con convolutional neural network, uh, it would have taken uh, much more time uh, than this one. So it has uh, run for 100 rounds. And at the end, it has shown the overall accuracy of the global model. And as, as we can expect, the accuracy uh, you know, increases as we go uh, through these um, rounds here. And at the same time, we have uh, the accuracy uh, of these local uh, clients as well. So for the local client one, uh, they have the accuracy on its own uh, testing data set of 98.89. It has a bit different and it has a bit different as well. As we can expect, uh, the testing on their respective uh, testing data set will be a bit different to each other. But this one, the server uh, representing this 98.54, uh, it's a global, it's the accuracy of the uh, global model being trained in this federated learning setup. Okay, let's go back uh, to the slides. So that, that was a small, uh, you know, a demonstration um, on the FL. Moving on, uh, let's talk about uh, the different types of, uh, of, of uh, federated learning. And the types of federated learning uh, depends on the type of data partitioning we have. Uh, we can have this horizontal data partitioning uh, in which the distributed or the participating nodes, or participating clients uh, have the same input features, but they have different data points. For example, these three hospitals, uh, they have the same uh, input features, which are labeled as X1, X2, and X3, along with the outcome feature, which is labeled as Y. Uh, but they have different data points or different uh, set of patients. The first one has the patients, uh, you know, uh, represented as P1, P2. The other one has P3, P4, and the third one has P5 and P6. The example that that we have seen uh, in in in, the, in that code, uh, this Excel sheet. This is an example of the horizontal data partitioning. That is, all of these three distributed lines have the same input features, which are labeled as feature A, B, C, and D, along with a label a feature, but they have different data points. So this is the example of the horizontal uh, data partitioning. And the algorithm that we have run uh, for this data is the horizontal uh, federated learning. So um, for horizontal uh, federated learning, there are a number of uh, open source uh, FL tools available. Uh, one of them is Flower. We have just seen um, an example for, for, for this tool. Beside that, we have the Flare from NVIDIA, FedN, IBM FL, OpenFL, and OSCET, uh, our in-house uh, uh, federated learning tool. It's not open source at the moment, but we are aiming uh, to make it open source, uh, open source uh, in near future. Uh, beside horizontal data partitioning, we have this vertical data partitioning uh, in which the participating clients uh, have the same data points, but they have different features, different input, input features. For example, these three hospitals, they all have the same uh, patients labeled as P1, P2, P3, and P4, uh, but they have uh, different uh, input features, you know, labeled as X1 for the hospital one, X2 for the hospital two, and X3 uh, for the third hospital. The one hospital can, can be working uh, on a specific uh, disease. It can have the, democra uh, the democratic uh, information of the patients um, uh, alongside with some, uh, some disease characteristics such as imaging, you know, and so on and so forth. And beside that, we can have a, one more hospital or one more um, for, for or, or registry in, in, in which we have additional uh, input features for the same uh, patients. For vertical uh, uh, data partitioning, there are very limited tools as compared to the horizontal one. Uh, I have listed a couple of them here by, by SIF uh, and, uh, and Flower, uh, but uh, still uh, these two doesn't provide uh, as comprehensive uh, demonstration of vertical FL as compared to the horizontal FL. At Ingram, we have developed a, a work on vertical uh, FL based on the neural network. We have uh, developed the mathematical model for this vertical FL uh, 
redundant dissimulations, uh, the privacy analysis, and so on and so forth. And this work is currently uh, under review um, at the moment. And then we have um, a combined data partitioning scenario, a, a hybrid approach in which uh, the data is both horizontally and vertically partitioned uh, between uh, different nodes. For example, on the left-hand side, we have these two hospitals where the data is horizontally partitioned between them. That is, both of these hospitals have the same features of X1 and X2, uh, but they have different set of patients. The one, the first hospital has the patients P1 and P2, and the other one has P3 and P4. And beside these hospitals, on the right-hand side, let's say we have a registry uh, in which we have additional uh, input feature labeled as X3, uh, but the set of patients are identical or similar uh, to what we have uh, in, in those hospitals, which are P1, P2, P3, and P4. So there are two levels of data partitioning. Uh, at the inner level, we have the horizontal data partitioning between the group of bit, 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 between these hospitals. And if we consider these hospitals as one group and the registry as another, uh, then the data is vertically partitioned uh, between these, uh, these two groups. A more uh, simplistic uh, 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 description of the combined data partitioning is, is, is illustrated here, in which we have the input features of in, 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 in the row form and the data points are in the column form. So we have three clients, which are, which are represented as H client one, H client two, and H client three. The data is horizontally partitioned between them. That is each of these H clients have the similar features labeled from F1 to F6. And then we have one V client, uh, which has additional input features of F7, F8, and F9. But V client has the same data points as compared to those uh, three H clients. So it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's another representation of the combined data partitioning where we have both the horizontal and the vertical. And things get things can get uh, uh, more uh, complicated, um, uh, you know, uh, as presented here, in which we have a number of uh, horizontal and vertical clients, and 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 the that uh, that is both horizontally and vertically uh, partitioned uh, between them. Now, as far as FL tools are concerned for this combined data partitioning, uh, there is no available tool, to the best of my knowledge, um, yet. Uh, and this this gave us the motivation uh, of developing uh, a work on the combined uh, FL. We have developed a couple of uh, 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 algorithms for the federated learning uh, based on neural networks for the combined horizontal and vertical data partitioning. And these two works, uh, you know, cater uh, the the presented data partitioning scenarios in, in, in some of the previous slides and those and, and also catered some of the other uh, data partitioning scenarios as well. So these algorithms are quite uh, general, uh, generic in nature and can cater uh, most of the combined data partitioning scenarios. Again, we have developed the mathematical models for these um, uh, frameworks for these algorithms. Uh, did the simulations, privacy analysis, and making sure that there is no leakage of uh, data while sharing the model parameters and so on and so forth. This work is, is also uh, under review uh, at the moment. There are um, challenges associated uh, with FL. Uh, it is a fairly new technology. Um, so one, one can uh, think that there are certain challenges associated with uh, different aspects of FL. We have this data acquisition or pre-processing uh, aspect in which we need to make sure that each of the client is doing uh, the similar kind of pre-processing on their local data. For example, one client is, if, if one client is, is uh, standardizing the, the data by subtracting the zero mean of their uh, of their features, it has to be done by the other clients as well. Otherwise, it will impact uh, the performance of the global model. Uh, for the communication, again, we need to make sure that each client has uh, enough communication resources in terms of uh, bandwidth, uh, you know, uh, latency issues, and things like that. Uh, so, so that each participating uh, client can participate in this federated learning setup uh, in a timely manner. We don't want the server uh, to wait for certain clients to send their local models uh, in order to perceive this federated learning setup. Uh, 
Similarly, uh, we have to make sure that each participating client has enough computation resources. In the example that I've just demonstrated, uh, it's, it's a fairly simple one. Uh, if we have a imaging data, uh, then we need to make sure that each of the participating client have enough computation resources. Maybe um, a reasonable GPU is, is, is required at each of the distributed client uh, to compute uh, that specific convolution neural network. The aggregation, the server has to choose a specific aggregation uh, strategy uh, based on the needs uh, of the application. Uh, we have mentioned a couple of them, which are simple average uh, and the weighted average. Uh, but there are other aggregation techniques available as well, such as frame aggregation, quantization, quantized aggregation, and so on and so forth, which can be used you know, depending upon uh, the need of the application. Performance issues. Uh, we want the performance of the global model uh, to be as near uh, as possible to the performance of the machine learning model when trained in a centralized way. So we don't expect that the performance of, of the of the federated learning model uh, will be similar to the performance of the model when it is trained in a centralized way, but the but it is it is um, uh, um, we we try to uh, make make the performance uh, as near to uh, the performance of the model trained in a centralized way as 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 uh, much as possible. And the performance can easily uh, decrease when we have data imbalance issues. By data imbalance, I mean that um, if one client has significantly less number of data points as compared to the other clients, it will impact the performance. For example, one client can have, let's say only 50 data points, the other client can have 600, the, other, the, the third one can have 700. In that case, the performance of that global model will affect uh, due to this uh, data imbalancing. Then the privacy issue. Although th this privacy uh, thing is an inherent property of the federated learning because we are not sharing the local data uh, from the clients to the server, uh, but still it has been proven in the literature that the exchange of the model parameters can leak information about the raw data. So there is this, this one uh, aspect which, which needs, um, you know, uh, which, which needs uh, attention uh, to work, work in this space. Uh, there are uh, techniques such as secure aggregation, uh, differential privacy available, uh, which, can, which can add another layer of uh, privacy in this federated learning. And finally, we have the deployment issues uh, such as network security issues. So to deploy this federated learning, let's say on a number of distributed hospitals, uh, each of the hospital has to open a certain port for the incoming and outgoing uh, messages and connections. And by opening a port, we are actually opening a pathway uh, for, 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 for the network security uh, challenges. Uh, and we need to uh, tackle those different fireworks, um, firewalls and network issues in order to deploy uh, this FL as well. Now, at the moment, um, we are also working on a guide paper uh, which talks about uh, these different aspects, their challenges. And uh, this, this guide paper uh, gives uh, a, a, a comprehensive comparison of the federated machine learning and centralized machine learning. So if somebody is is, is new to uh, this, this federated uh, machine learning concept and try to decide whether to go for the centralized or to go for the federated one, uh, this guide paper uh, serves uh, that, 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 that purpose. It gives the right direction um, uh, to, to, the, to the reader to decide uh, which one to choose. It's still under um, a construction and there's a lot of uh, stakeholders uh, who are involved uh, in this project. And just to conclude uh, the things, uh, federated learning is, is a great framework uh, for the distributed machine learning uh, that preserve the privacy of the local data. We don't have to send the local data to the centralized server for the uh, machine learning. And that will enhance the data incorporation and utilization from a number of different uh, stakeholders. It is an emerging technology, so there's a lot of room to work. Uh, as I mentioned, those different aspects, there is still a lot of room to work on those you know, different aspects uh, and their associative uh, challenges. 
And for the future work, the work that we are doing at Income, we are trying to deploy or we are trying to build a tool uh, for the combined uh, federated learning or try to build on existing tools uh, so, so that we can cater this combined data partitioning of horizontal and vertical uh, for our use cases of uh, participating hospitals and a registry. Um, this work uh, has been uh, done under the supervision of Professor Louis Holloway and Dr. Matthew Field. And this project is financially supported by the Australian Research Data Commons, ARDC, uh, which is funded by National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Uh, and a special thanks to Ghana and Aleem for uh, supporting this project. And that's pretty much it uh, from my side. Um, thank you for listening. Any questions, please? Can see it. Thank you. Thank you, Anil, for a fantastic presentation. So there are a couple of questions in the chat that we will follow up. And um, there are a couple of questions from Christy. So um, Christy, would you want to highlight those questions? Um, the first one is regarding to secular trends, which changes over time, um, and how we can dealt with this using federated um, learning, actually. Yeah, I believe it's, it's regarding the time. I mean, uh, I believe it's regarding the communication time. So yeah, I, I did mention that, that the, the participating clients uh, should have enough uh, communication resources. Uh, we don't want the server uh, to wait for a specific client uh, so that that client can- uh... Sorry, sorry, Amir. It wasn't, it wasn't about that specifically. It was actually about um, changes that may occur over time. So you're updating your model and that maybe it wasn't clear to me whether that's kind of all in one hit in a day or whether you're doing that over time to ensure that the model's staying up to date. Oh, well. Um... I was just thinking about changes in in, in practice in, in things over time, that's all. Sure. So we have these number of uh, rounds and uh, it, it is expected that with each round, the performance should get better. And it, it is assumed that the local data remains, remains the same. So let's say we have a convolution neural network uh, in this federated learning, we have a server, we have 10 participating clients. Uh, each of, of these distributed clients have their own data. For a federated learning, let's say for 100 rounds, it will take five days, let's say uh, five days to complete these 100 rounds. The underlying assumption is that each of these distributed clients will have the same data on the Oh, group. okay. Yeah. So the data is not changing about that. So data. it's not it's not being updated in terms of it's got a hundred new patients into the hospital and they're going to use those data as well. Um uh, I understand now. Yeah. Yeah. So what about potentially in your in your slide that you had there at the end, updating your models in so you've you've got a model at the moment, and then in a year's time you come back yep. and you look at updating in a federated sense across all of your clients or new clients. Yeah, sure. So by updating, it means that when each of the client has trained their local model on their local data, they will send their uh, versions of the local mo models to the server, and server will simply averages those local models, and this will give us the updated version of the global model. Mm -hmm. And we have a new version of the global model because it has been uh, aggregated uh, from those different local models of those different uh, clients. And then this global model will be sent to each of the clients. These clients now use this updated version of the global model to train their data once more. And after the training, they will send those local models again to the server. Server again averages those local models to give us the another version of the global model. And as I mentioned, we expect that the performance of that global model, let's say in round three, uh, will have better uh, performance as compared to the performance of the global model in round two and so on and so forth. So in each round, uh, we have a new version of the global model. Yeah. I guess an important comment to make in that space, if it's okay for me to um, yeah. jump in, um, is that basically when you learn your model, you choose which data you learn that model on. And in a federated learning sense, sure, it takes a little bit longer 
to actually run the model than a centralized model. But for the purpose of learning a model, we're talking kind of a similar time frame. Like it's just a, a point snapshot. It's not as though the data is changing in real time as we're learning the model. But one of the distinct advantages is that because we can update those la local data sets in an ongoing manner, then we can come back in 12 months time and do a validation assessment with new data. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. And see if, and then I was, because I was actually thinking that you were doing it over time, not kind of all in one hit, if that makes sense. Yeah. I thought it was happening over a period of time and that's why I was thinking about the secular trends, that's all. Thank yeah. you, Amir. That's really interesting. Thanks. I think another aspect to this is that um, if you're adding new features later on, you can take that model that's already been trained, modify that and start the whole process again. Yes, definitely. Uh, kind of... Um, transfer learning. So once we have a trained uh, global model, we can use that maybe for the new data. We don't have to start that um, from very scratch from the random global model. Yeah. Okay, that's, that sounds great. So there is a question for the um, It's like, do model parameter means model weights um, here in this context? Sorry, I, I didn't get that you early. Does model parameters mean yep. model weights? Yep. Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, model. Uh, the global model essentially means the uh, model parameters, which are the uh, weights, matrices, and the bias vectors. Uh, in the case of a neural network. Yep. Okay. So, there are a couple of more questions from Tan. Um. So, Tan, would you like to ask a couple of more questions that you have already listed from Amir here? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can. Hear you. Oh, cool. Um, so um, so I want to integrate a federated learning system, mm -hmm. uh, for client side, and I'm concerned if in case the client updated the model using wrong, say, Groutroot, so it's gonna <gasps> downgrade the model performance. Um, so can you, can your tool ensure that it keep and compare with? Um, some graduate on your side in the server to, uh, not make it it make it worse. Sure. Uh, so uh, we call these um attacks as poisoning as poisoning attacks, where uh a client um intentionally uh provides uh or train the data uh on a false um data. Uh, it, it can be it can be a case where the data is false or maybe the client is sending the false values of the local model parameter to the server. In either case, the, the client is trying to poison this, this global model or overall uh, training system. And there are mechanisms uh, in place in which the server can, 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 can detect uh, if the client is trying to have have these poisoning attacks, if the client is trying to send uh, the false information, either in terms of the model parameters or either uh, if the client is trying to uh, train the model on a false uh, data. So yeah, the DRR mechanisms um, in place uh, if there are poisoning attacks in the system. Okay. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Um, and uh, will you open source your code because you say that it's under review and you did not open source it for the algorithm that combining vertical and horizontal federated learning? So uh, for the vertical one and for the combined one, although the papers are uh, under review, uh, but I, I don't think uh, we would mind uh, making it making them public at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, after this um, talk, you can, get, you can contact me and uh, I can pass those to you. Oh, okay, that would be cool. Yeah, I think that was it from my side. Thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of more questions from SK, um, and those were around um, data balance issues. So the first question is around how are the data balance issues can be handled? I think, Amir, you have highlighted some of the solutions in your talk. And if you want to highlight again that how we can handle 
data balance issues in this um, figurative learning? Sure. Uh, so as I mentioned, this data heterogeneity, and this is a very common issue uh, in affidavit learning. Uh, we don't expect that each of the client will have uh, the same number of uh, data points, not only the number of data points, uh, but the class imbalance as well. It can be uh, it can be a case that um, in, in, the, in the scenario for let's say binary classification problem, one client has more um, uh, class one examples um, and other client have more class zero examples. This, this is the case for the data imbalance as well. Um, so, the, we we can tackle uh, uh, these. Uh, there are number of different uh, strategies that I have read. Um, I can't comment on the on these uh, on the specific detailing of these strategies. Uh, but what I have read and learned, yeah, these are uh, there are uh, specific strategies available uh, in FL uh, that handles uh, the data uh, the data heterogeneity, both the class imbalance and the data points um, imbalance in FL. Yeah, um, following to this question, there is a question also regarding: Are there any centralized designed pre-processing protocols? So the question is around, are there any centrally designed pre-processing protocols which can be helpful in terms of data biasing of the model? Um, not sure about that. Um, maybe, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of any, any specific strategy around that. Okay. Um, SK, I think, would you want to highlight? I think I your more insights on this question regarding to pre-processing protocols? Uh, uh, well, I think this is a very simple uh, perspective. Uh, uh, what, what I was saying is, for example, if the two clients sending the data, do you say that we all agree that we pre-process the data in certain way so that, uh, you know, in the case of binary classification, you have like more or less 50% of each class at both the clients. So the clients sort of pre-process the data before they use it for training. So this is what I meant by uh, centrally designed pre-processing -pro protocols. But I think following upon what uh, you said, Amir, um, uh, which is if you have uh, detection, automated de detection mechanisms for uh, poisoning of the models, uh, do you think you can generalize those algorithms uh, for this where you automatically detect uh, I have more classes, uh, more data points from the same class coming from this client. So I would handle this data in certain way. Sure, uh, the server can, can know about that. Uh, I mean, uh, the information regarding the number of data points uh, and the number of uh, classes in that uh, uh, data set, uh, I believe th th this is not something private. The server can know that. Um, in terms of uh, making arrangement uh, such that each of the client will have the same number of labels or same number of data points that won't be feasible in 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 each and every case. For example, if one client has has thousand uh, data points and out, out of thousand data points, it has nine hundred and fifty uh, data points which have which correspond to one. Uh, single uh, class label and the rest of 50 correspond to the other class label. And the rest of the clients have, let's say, 1,000, 1,500, and so on and so forth data points with equally uh, distributed uh, class labels. It will not be wise uh, to, 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 to say to client one that, look, uh, you have 950 class labels. Please uh, delete or remove 900 data points so, so that you can have a balanced um, uh, class distribution. There are much more uh, sophisticated ways to to tackle um, the, 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 these issues uh, instead of just you know removing or deleting uh, any overlapping or you know um, redundant kind of information here. Does this make sense? Oh yeah, uh, it does make sense. Thank you very much. Uh, and a uh, great talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, SK. Um, there is a follow-up question from Jigal, um, and which is regarding to horizontal federated learning, uh, where all the clients have um, same columns, but um, different rows. I'm assuming that this is, again, a, a problem of um, 
data balance um, question that we have discussed earlier. So, um, Diego, if you want to highlight this question further, Amir can comprehend this further. Uh, th thank you. No, it's not a question. Actually, I was just commenting as, as Amir was explaining. And, and I noticed that he later explained about horizontal uh, federated learning. So I was just putting a comment. But my question comes a bit further down the timeline. And it is, have you used the or, exper or experimented with the FATE framework? That's another framework, F-A-T-E. Yeah, um, uh, I believe we have just read about that. One of our, our other uh, our member, Daniel, is looking into uh, uh, more in, into more detail of these different open source uh, open source FL tools, uh, but no, I haven't I haven't gone gone into the details of that uh, specific FL tool. Sorry. Uh, th th thank you. And the, the reason why I ask the question is because uh, all of these frameworks are, are fairly new and they are changing all the time. And yes. They sometimes are. sometimes you go to look at the code as the source code and the documentation is not properly done or the examples are out of date, uh, it's, it's difficult to learn from them because they don't, yes, they don't have good information. Yes, it is. Uh, ju 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 just to give you an example on this one, uh, this is Flower one as well. They have different, uh, you know, different versions going on and on. Uh, but they have they, they have really nice uh, documentation on their GitHub page and on their uh, main page as well. Uh, and then they have mentioned these uh, requirements, uh, you know, in 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 building the simulation setup. And one of the dependency that I have seen uh, is the Flower version. So the Flower version has to be between this one point eight and less than two point zero to work uh, to to work this simulation. So if you are using a newer version of Lava, this specific example won't work and so on and so forth. So yeah, these are different open source tools are you know continuously changing. Uh, you need to keep track of them, the right version, the right dependencies and things like that. And, and th things can, can, can get a bit tricky, uh, you know, uh, while working with these uh, different tools. But I guess this is, this is what it is. Yeah, that, right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, there is one more question from Dom, um, which is regarding to um, sensitive data and the value proposition of federated learning. So let's say if if, if uh, for a data scientist who is like building a model, is it always necessary to remotely access the data? So the question is around sensitive data and the application of federated learning. I can try to explain that a bit more. Uh, it's just in your, and thanks Amir for the great presentation. Uh, yeah. when, when you try to deploy federated learning on sites, uh, mm -hmm. and you say, no, the value proposition that the data will never leave the site. But then as a data scientist building a model, you feel the need to say, well, I need to have a look at the data at some stage because you, know, you want to do some troubleshooting or there is something happening. Do you feel that need to still having to remotely access the data or can you say confidently, I'm just going to you know, share the weights and I don't need to see the data never? Yeah, I can say this with, with, um, with, with pretty confidence that, yeah, uh, for federal learning, you don't need to see uh, the data at all. Uh, you don't need to access this data. Uh, at all. Uh, you may need some of the uh, other information regarding uh, the data, for example, how many data points they have, uh, how many uh, input features they have, uh, things like that. But the actual data, you don't need to access or to see this data. Uh, one thing I can comment, I mean, uh, if you want to do some data statistics uh, on some data, you can do this in, in a secure research environment, you know, uh, SREs or TRE, uh, I'm, I'm not sure are you familiar with those or not, uh, but that, that uh, those, those things uh, let you do the uh, statistic in a very um, confined um, manner in which you can see the data, you can assess the data within uh, certain limitations and boundaries. Okay, so um, the last question, which is quite interesting in terms of applications um, and in application in terms of real-world implementation. So 
uh, Yuri asked that, um, can you highlight uh, a real life problems that has been like addressed by Flar or the other FL frameworks? Um, so, real world examples. Sure. Uh, so we have this OSCAT in house, uh, you know, federated um, learning network uh, in which we have a number of participating um, hospitals. We have deployed this for our number of hospitals um, for a real time application. And uh, and by the way, this federated learning was initially developed by Google in 2016. Um, and, and the application was to learn uh, specific patterns from the Android mobile users. So they have deployed this and they have already, uh, they, this is an on ongoing uh, uh, a thing. They have deployed this federated learning uh, for their distributed Android users, which are in millions of uh, of number. So yeah, that, that, that's the another um, practical real-time application of FL. Okay, um, that sounds fantastic. And uh, we have all the questions um, covered from the chat. Um, does anyone have any other questions for Amit? I've got another one. Okay. So what, what kind of skills are required at each site? So they need some IT skill because they need to look after a server and they need to start that server. Do they also need to have machine learning skills because do they need to understand the model that is going to be to be run on their data? Do they, you know, do they go through the code? Do they need to be involved in that process? Sure. Yeah, ideally, what what we would want um, um, is a person with these skills, you know, machine learning skills, IT skills, software skills, and things like that. Uh, but with the evolution of technology, you know, Docker's in which we can put all of these Python other code files at one place uh, in a Docker image, and we just need to run that. We don't have to worry about. Uh, different things, different, um, you know, versions of, of a code, different dependencies and things like that. Uh, so if someone is uh, skilled enough as far as IT and software is concerned, um, we can do this uh, FL uh, uh, stuff using the Docker's uh, images uh, and containers. But ideally, yes, if, uh, it, it, it would be great if some, somebody has the skills of uh, machine learning, um, IT, uh, you know, no know about the network, uh, security things, IPs, port numbers, uh, things like that, and a bit of software as well. Thank you. Okay, that Amir, I have uh, one question for you. Sure. Um, in in your federated learning uh, network, so where where do the TRE sit, uh, or or like does your data or the model parameters have to pass through the TRE, or can uh, it go even without skip the TRE totally? Sure. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are not taking into account the TREs. Uh, what we have learned that uh, TREs have this uh, constraint on data ingress and outgress. Uh, there has to be a manual inspection of data ingress and outgress. So uh, we can't do this federated learning at the moment, um, including these TREs, uh, because that, that will take you know uh, a lot of time to do the manual inspection for each of the round. So at the moment, uh, we are not taking uh, into account these TREs or SREs, but this is some, some, something for, for the future. And we are uh, tackling, tackling this issue of uh, incorporating TREs and SREs in this FL. So if, uh, if, if we are able to convince uh, your network not mm -hmm. to use TREs for specifically when you're doing federated learning. Is it, would that be ideal situation, I guess? In, ideal in a sense that, uh, look, if there is, uh, uh, if there is data at TREs and we want to incorporate that data, um, let's say the, the data is uh, too much meaningful and we really want to include that data uh, into our FL uh, framework, um, and we don't want to leave that data because that data can impact the overall uh, performance of the global model. In that case, it may be a bit tricky to leave uh, TREs, 
Um, otherwise, uh, as I mentioned, um, it, it, it's not feasible um, at the moment uh, to incorporate uh, TREs uh, into the FL. Thank you, thank you. If I can also maybe address that question, uh, I would say that for federated learning, we find it's easier to have a specific server that is secure and with only the data for participating in the learning as yep. opposed to making a hole in a, in a TRE uh, and, and changing the data governance uh, model of a TRE to allow like, automatic uh, transmission of the weights. Yeah. Or the, I think yeah. it's, it's easier at this point of time to do that outside of a TRE, but there is a lot of work around federated activities, not learning, but activities, which then have a mechanism for uh, uh, working in a federation between TREs. Yeah, but some learning is a bit of a specific case, which somehow is easier to uh, to deal with outside of TREs. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's it's much easier to do uh, this FL outside these, these TREs, at least for the moment. And yeah, but there is a lot uh, happening in this space. You know, incorporating these TREs and SREs um, into the FL. Yep. And Lois mentioned that it's it's more about a challenge of governance, I guess. So, yeah, I agree. So are there any other questions before I put my last question to Ahmed and then we'll close this session? Okay. So if there are no other questions, um, one of the questions that I was interested to um, understand was like, there's a trade-off between accuracy and model performance between centralized machine learning and the federated learning. So there is a there is a huge debate on, let's say, FL actually offers a better privacy, but sometimes it achieves a lower accuracy than centralized machine learning. So um, what are the recent um, research trends to improve the accuracy in FL? Um, are there any recent updates on this area? So that because in machine learning, in, in a bigger picture, accuracy is one of the key outputs that users are always looking for. Um, so, so I just want to understand how can this accuracy can be improved in this federated learning compared to what we usually achieved in centralized machine learning processes? Sure, yeah, that, that's, that, that's the biggest concern in FL that we want the accuracy of the global model uh, as close to the performance of the model train in a centralized way. If you see the mathematics of, of the FL, uh, if we if we do one epoch training, one iteration at each node and send those local models back to the server, then the mathematical model will be exactly same uh, as we have trained in a centralized way. But in that case, um, it, it will take a lot of time because we are just doing one iteration at, at, at each of the uh, local um, client side. So if we, if we do more, training cycles, let's say 10 epochs as, as I've shown in that example, mm -hmm. uh, the mathematical model will be a bit different to what we have in a centralized way. And that difference will cause a dip uh, in, in the performance. There are uh, works that I have seen uh, which talk about optimizing the number of epochs at each of the client side so that we can have the maximum uh, performance uh, out, out of this uh, FL. Besides this, this training thing, there are uh, other uh, uh, techniques as well which, which boost the performance of, of, the, uh, of the FL. I have seen in, in the literature, I can't talk about specifically how they have done it, but yeah, that's one of the uh, active research area uh, in the FL, which is you know trying to boost the performance or trying to you know uh, uh, reach the performance of a centralized machine learning model as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, actually that makes sense. And uh, and one of the other thing um, that based on my experience I have noticed is like um, uh, the security challenges that that are around even in federated learning. Um, because um, it offers privacy, um, but it also um, uh, just like comes with security challenges. And I think you mentioned about the communication module in your presentation. Um, and while incorporating the global model, different participants communicate the model parameters and, um, and their training modules uh, uh, 
and they communicate in a kind of with each other. And during this communication, there could be a security um, uh, or vulnerable attacks, which can be like a part of this process. So um, I think in terms of security challenges, this is a more of a kind of discussion rather than a question from my side. I think the fate framework that has been shared here could be one of the useful thing which can be might be used to address the security challenges. That's a point of discussion in FL for a long time. And I just looked at the Fed um, framework at the GitHub and it says that it addresses some of the security challenges that FL is currently facing. So it's it's I think it's a worth area to explore uh, this framework um, just to understand because there is a there is a lot of research which says that federating learning is really useful, but it also comes with the security challenges. Um, let's say one of the challenge is like a between communication of different uh, participants. And during those communications, the protocols can, can get vulnerable and there could be different kind of cyber security attacks and all the other things that, that can be handled in more effective manner. So might be this fair framework could be one of the things that could be like a useful thing for FL research researchers in the future. Sure. Uh, as, as far as uh, I know, uh, most of the open source tools, open source tools uh, offer uh, these extra layer of protection. Uh, there is this, you know, a famous paper on uh, deep leakage from gradients in which they have shown that those model parameters can leak information about the local data and, and one can easily reconstruct the local data just from mm -hmm. those model parameters. And yeah. as I mentioned in, in my presentation, there are techniques available such as differential privacy in which we add uh, noise uh, to the model mm -hmm. parameter a bit of random noise in the model parameters uh, and that that can prevent uh, the leakage of the uh, raw data or we can use secure aggregation uh, mm -hmm. in which uh, we can aggregate those local models uh, securely so these are the techniques which uh, which aim to uh, prevent this uh, the, the, this uh, data leakage uh, from those local model parameters so if we are using let's say horizontal fl and if we are sending those local model parameters as they are to the server, there are chances that those local model parameters leak information uh, regarding mm -hmm. the local data. So in order to prevent that, uh, there are uh, 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 techniques, you know, uh, which uh, offer uh, countermeasures uh, for this. So um, thank you so much. I mean, it was a fantastic session and um, very useful for me. Um, and um, thank you once again from Machine Learning Community of Practice side. Um, and I also thank you all for coming into this session. Um, it's really useful and it's great to see how interactive this session was. Um, and we look forward for your contributions or participations in the coming events also. So thank you so much once again for coming along. and. Um, and I will hand over to my colleague Kylie for the closing remarks. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, a huge thank you from, from me too. I've had a little bit of exposure to machine learning um, off and on over the years. And so I learned so much <laughs> um, from your presentation today, Amir. Thanks so much yeah. again. Um, so yes, um, we will make the recording um, and the link to the slides available um, through OSDE and the ML4AU Communities of Practice, we'll send that out. So, um, yeah, thanks so much again, Amir, and stay tuned for future webinars. So thanks cool. again and have a good day, everybody. Yeah, to you. Thank, thank, thank you so much, Kylie. Thank, thank, you, thank you for thank this you. opportunity to present my work here. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. See you. Bye. Bye.